I am I'm Brian Taylor, and I am the Associate Communication Director for the Southern Union. And Elder Lamb asked me to do a couple of things today. Um, one, he asked me to to do a workshop on how to write a news feature and how to write for Southern Tidings to give information for about obituaries for Southern Tidings and as well as advertising um, for them. Um, in the church where you are, are you the communication person there? Yes, this is my first year. Oh, great. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so are you familiar, let's start with, are you familiar with Southern Tidings? Oh, yes. When okay. I was a principal, I used to have articles going in all the time. Oh, great. Oh, good. Oh, good, 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 good. Then, then this, okay, then this is good. So I will, so we'll just, uh, so this is probably, I barely oh, hear you. you barely hear me. Okay, let me, let me see. Let me turn my microphone up some here. Um, is that better? It's a little better. That's a little better there. Okay, I'm just trying to, let me check my mic to see, make sure the volume in. It may be mine. And Zoom is up. Um, where's the microphone here? Speaker. Okay, let me just look at, <clears throat> let me go here and look at the audio settings here just for a second here. Okay, hi, is that better? That's better. That's better? Let's see, but that will not. Yeah, I'm trying to adjust it here in zoom to see if it goes up see if it will stay up there okay but you said that is better though yes okay good good well, since you're a principal this is this is probably I used, I used to be a principal i'm sorry i used to be i'm retired now oh, you're retired now oh okay great great okay so this so so this will be familiar territory for you and and perhaps many times old news um but you know at any point along the way as we're going you can always just just stop me and you know if you have a question or comment or something or if you want me to clarify something I can I will I can easily do that for you. Um, so just want to kind of look at a writing a a news story um, there. So one of one of the biggest things in writing a news story is the headline itself. So I, I want to share with you just share with you eight eight different types of headlines. The, the headline, as you know, is, is in an important part of the feature because you have about um, five to 10 seconds to capture that audience. They will read the headline and decide, do I wanna read this or not based on what that headline is. So you wanna make sure you have a captivating headline. Um, eight different types of headlines. So the First one is is a direct headline, and it's it's just that you know the direct headline. Um, here we go. So we will say the direct headline is um, silk blouses fifty five percent fifty five percent off. A direct headline. It hits you straight to the point. You know, no guessing about what it's going to be about. So a direct headline. A indirect headline um, is someone. It's one that will create some interest and curiosity it will kind of spark some things it, at times it has a double meaning so the person not quite sure so they'll keep reading just to see what it is and in the indirect headline it raises some curiosity and questions that are actually answered in that particular um, story or feature that's being written the other one is just a news headline it's just what it is you know um, the savannah church the savannah church celebrated its 175th anniversary um, it's clear and cut and direct to them. Um, then one of the other one is what is is very, very popular. Um, it's probably one of the most searched topics on Google or any search engine because everyone puts in how to, how to work my iPhone, how to upload a video, you know, how to stream something. So that high how to headlines or great because a person knows they are about to learn something that they perhaps did not know before. Um, the fifth one is the headline that, that raises a question or ask a question um, that will, they realize will be answered in the particular article. Then it's the, the headline is a command. It's one 
that not only commands the attention, but gives a command. Um, give today, donate blood now. Um, those are commanding headlines because they give a particular action that they want that reader to do and to know. Um, then the reasons why, um, or is another one. And probably the last one is the testimonial headline. Um, the testimonial headline probably will begin for a church function um, was, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the 175th anniversary of our church. Um, as a testimony, hell, people are like, oh wow, what what happened? You know, why was that? What was so great about it? Why did they want to let us know that? So those are just some ways um, to do some headlines and different types that you can do. Um, any great article and every great article and every piece of great writing has these six things that Rudyard um, Rudyard Kipling always talked about. I have six honest serving men. They have taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. You know them well. Who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, these six are key and critical to any um, article or, or story writing that happens because they not only asked the important questions, but they share the important and critical information that readers are looking for to have there. So any good news stories answers each of these questions. And it's one that if you're going to write, you want to make sure that you drill them into your head, into your mind, into your brain, so they become second nature um, as you're writing. Um, so if you're going to cover a story, let's say you're doing one, an example I use here is on a sports team doing a competition. So you want to answer those questions. Who is the team? Um, who is the coach? Who are the prominent players? Who are the supporters? Um, information that people with reading will want to know and to have for that. When you look at the what, what sport did they play? What was What is the competition that they entered into? Um, the where, where is the competition? Where do they normally play? What city are they based out of? What church do they belong to? Um, and where is their church, rather, you could ask. Um, then when is the competition? You know, how long have they been getting ready for this? You know, how long have those pathfinders been practicing? Um, when is their next event? When do they rehearse? Um, those kind of things you want, to, you want to place there. And then why? You know, why are they doing this? Because the why is not only relevant information to the team and information for them, but it's relevant to the reader. Why are they doing this? And why should I, as a reader, take the time to read this? That information is critical to everyone that reads. And then the how. Um, this example, you know, how are they going to enter the competition? How do they raise funds? How much training that they have? Um, so those are important. In writing, especially for the tidings and for church things, you want to always get a quote. You want to get a quote. In this example, it will be a quote from the, uh, the coach, the team member, or spectator. If you use an example I had of the 175th anniversary of the church, you want to get a quote from someone who was there, someone who attended, so that they can share with you, oh, I love this. It's amazing. I didn't know the church was 175 years old. This program was fantastic because I learned more history about the church. Um, you want to get a quote from someone who participated on the program. Um, and you want to get a quote from someone who helped organize the program um, because they will give three different perspectives of that event for your reader to capture from. And quotes are great because people will recognize names. They say, oh, I know that person. Oh, yeah, they said so and so. That's great. Um, so quotes help to quotes help to make the story human. Um, stories are often filled with information and facts and figures and statistics and dates and times. But it is the quote that creates the human aspect of it and allows people to have feeling and connection and relevancy to that particular event. So you always want to make sure you include um, three quotes, at least three quotes in something that you're writing for the church or that you're sending for Southern Tidings for publication. Um, 
<clears throat> I want to just share with you um, a tried and tested and true method, which is the inverted pyramid that is always used in journalism where the most important things are placed at the very beginning. Um, so ideally your first paragraph should have enough information in it and a good overview of the story so that if that person stopped reading after that first or second paragraph, they have everything that you wanted them to know. So that's one reason to use the inverted pyramid. The other one is, is that oftentimes um, articles are written and stories are written. And as you know, they go through the editing process and the editor may not have enough space to include the entire article. Uh, when I was communication director at a conference, um, people would send articles in that were, you know, 1500 words in an article and you really only had space for 500. So you would chop that article in half. Uh, and, and, um, so you want to make sure that even if the editor does have to cut your article, that the key information will always come through because you have it in those first one or two paragraphs. So that if that person stopped reading after that, they have, um, all the information that they really need, um, for that. So here I'm gonna give you two, um, visuals and graphics of the inverted pyramid. Um, the very first thing is the most important information, information that the reader must know those, the key message and where those six things are answered in there in that first one or two paragraphs, you want to do that. The second section there is more details where you just give important and unique details. There are things that are, that are in there that are important to the story, but if the reader never read them, they wouldn't be lost and they still have the essence of what the story or the article was about. Uh, and then the third section, there is the conclusion. It's information that's good, it's nice, but it's not critical. It's, it, it doesn't make or break the story because you have top loaded it so heavy with the information at the beginning that it helps the person to know I, I've got information I need. And the other parts just kind of add to it and give more illustration and direction to the story. Um, here's another way to look at that. Um, in, in writing, using the inverted pyramid, you have the lead, where you're answering those six things. You have the body where there's evidence and arguments, background information, stories, some other things. And then you have the tail um, that just gives extra content um, to kind of add to the story. So the lead, the body, and then the tail that's there. So what makes a good news story? <clears throat> the first thing that makes a good news story, as you see there, is timing. Um, and that includes the topics, the events, because you want to make sure that the story is current. Um, for things that are, when you're writing for the Southern Tidings, um, one thing you want to keep in mind is that the Southern Tidings magazine is 60 days. We're about two months out. So stories that are submitted in February will appear in the April issue. Um, so you want to keep that in mind in terms of writing. So, I often share that because I, uh, as communication director, I, I received a article once in May and the article was about a toy drive. And so when they saw the June issue, they wondered, well, Hey, what happened to my story? We had a great story and it was about the, I said, yes. Yeah, so it's June. We're going into summer and people are going to wonder why are we talking about Christmas and toy drives and things? Um, so the timing of the event, um, is important, especially in terms of the person reading it. Um, so that's timing. The second one is significance and the significance of the story, um, to the number of people that the story can affect. Um, it could be a great story. It can be a wonderful one, but it's significant to the people that are going to read it or that you're writing for, because you want to make sure that you always write to your audience. So you have timing, you have significance. The third one is prominence is what makes a good story. Um, it may be sad, but it is true. And that is famous people get 
more coverage than regular Joe. Um, regular Joe may be famous in your organization, but not famous to anyone else. Here, here, so here's an example. Let's say that um, your church during COVID um, delivered groceries. Um, they became, you know, Uber Eats or they became DoorDash and there were people in the community who had ordered from the local grocery store but weren't un were unable to get out or afraid to go out. And your church picked those groceries up and delivered it to them. Um, and your story may have said that, you know, um, Deacon Jones drove his truck and he picked up the groceries and he went with us door to door. And that's great. The prominence would be, and our mayor was with us and mayor so-and-so went door to door with us. And the police of chief, he gave us an escort through the neighborhood so we could get through the traffic and make some ways. Those prominent things are things that people are like, wow, that was great. Now there's nothing wrong with Deacon Jones and he's a good man, but when you're writing to a large audience, they may not know how important and how special Deacon Jones is to your organization unless you build that into the story. Um, but automatically they will know the importance of the mayor and the police chief. So if you want, if you're going to use um, people who are important to your organization and members, you need to kind of build into that story their prominence so that everyone knows just how important and special they are to everyone in, that's there and around your church or the organization that you're talking about. Then the fourth piece of, of what makes a story is the human interest. Um, this perhaps is one of the critical and most important pieces is the human interest because it's what creates the emotion, the feeling of the story, um, the warm and fuzzies, the feel goods. Oh, oh yes, oh, I, I, that, I, can, I, I can relate to that. It's, it's that. it's that part that says, I'm infuriated too. I would be so mad if that had happened. I understand what the writer's talking about. Um, that human interest part of the story is what um, is so very important. I um, want to welcome Lynn who's with us and I'm going to share with each of you all. Um, you can use the chat or the raise the hand function at any time. Um, it, and then I can, you know, I'll stop and kind of go back over something or answer a question or, or clarify something if you need to. So you can always do that at any time as we are going through this particular um, presentation. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Ms. Banks. Um, this PowerPoint that you're using, would you be able to email that to us? Yes. And so what, what I'll have you do is to put your email address in the chat. Okay. Um, if you put it in the chat and um, what the communication department has been doing is taking the emails from the chat and sending it out to the people okay. who were present. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so a couple of principles of good writing, um, clear, concise, simple, and direct. If you look at that, I just used the inverted pyramid you could stop reading the principles of good writing and have what you need to write and to do it well, because you're going to make it clear, you're going to make it concise. It's going to be simple. It's going to be direct. They're not going to be wondering what you're talking about. It's not going to be wordy and so long and, 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 and windy, and it's not going to be so complicated that they're not quite sure how to do it. And it's going to be direct. They won't be trying to figure out, now, what exactly do they want me to do? What, what is it that they're trying to tell me? So clear, concise, simple, and direct. And then a uh, principle of good writing is you want to transmit information and ideas and feelings. Information, yes, important and critical, but you want to make sure that you have ideas and feelings because the person needs to be able to um, relate to it see themselves as a part of it and within that particular um, article. Um, another principle there. One of the other ones is create pictures of ideals that readers can imagine. Let me give you an example of that. So let's say that you are writing an article um, 
and we'll do this. Here we go. There, here, here's an example of that, um, of the early morning catch. Rising sun, fisherman on, on the shore, and he has his, he has his catch for the day. Um, and so you want to create pictures of ideals that readers can, can imagine. And then you want to have, um, you want to use precise, be precise. You want to be precise and you want to use words for the exact meaning. Um, you don't want to write the article and the person is not quite sure if you're asking them to volunteer or if you're asking them to go get people to volunteer. If you're asking them to give now or if you're asking them, you know, just to hold on to it and at a later date, give it. So you want to make sure that it's, that it's using precise words so they are clear about what it is that you are asking and presenting before them to do. Um, this one sounds elementary, but it is very critical. And that is to use simple, familiar words. To use simple, familiar words words um the reading level why well, shouldn't i say the reading level um the the major publications write for a ninth grade reading level um so anything that you read if you're reading um new york times wall street journal well not major not wall street journal new york times um the washington post any of those publications, Time magazines, most of the things are written at a ninth grade reading level because they want the majority of the people to get it. Um, so you want to use simple and familiar words unless you're writing to a specific group. Um, it's a scholarly article or something like that understands the other parts of it as well. Um, so you want to do that. Then you want to eliminate jargon and clicks as much as possible. I always joke that the Adventist church has more uh, jargon than anyone else because we will say, um, we will say the NAD, the GC beta, we will say, you know, we'll say, uh, yeah, I, I'm going, you know, I just left SEC camp meeting and I'm going over to, to SAC camp meeting and, and then I went to that convention and the people within the circle may understand it. But if that magazine is sitting on a member's table and a neighbor comes over or a family member who's not Adventist picks it up and starts reading it and they see GC, they're wondering, is that general contractor? They're not quite sure what that is. Um, so we want to try to eliminate as many of, as much of the jargon and clicks and those kind of things in the writing so that people are familiar with what we are talking about and sharing. Um, as always, in any good writing, you want to pay close attention to your nouns and verbs that are there. And then use simple sentences. Uh, make it easy for them to read so that it's clear, concise, and direct. And then you want to vary the sentence and paragraph style and length. Um, you want to make sure that every sentence is not four words. No. Jane went to the store, you know, Johnny dropped the baloney, you know, the dog picked it up, the, the, the dog ate it and ran away. Uh, that will become very monotonous to the reader because it's the same four um, word sentence and becomes very choppy and it doesn't really flow. So you want to vary the sentence length and style and paragraphs so that people enjoy it as they are going and they have an experience to walk through it with you. Um, so that's there. Oh, that's, what did I, did I, let me go back for a second, sorry. So those are principles of, of writing. Um, one of the other things that um, Elder Lamb asked me to do was to talk about um, obituaries and how to submit your obituaries to the Southern Tidings. Um, so, so here, so your news stories, your articles about things that are happening in your church, you send those to the conference communicator 
and the conference communication department and they go through them and then they upload them um, through our publishing software to the union. Obituaries you send directly to the union office. Um, it, it's sad, but but it is true that the obituary section of, of most union magazines is probably one of the most read sections um, because people are, one, they're looking to make sure that their friends are not there. Um, the other one is they're looking to see if their friends are there so that they, that they may not have heard about, so that they can reach out to the family with a card or flower or condolence of some sort. So that's one that is very important. Um, give you a couple of things for submitting and writing obituaries for the Southern Tidings. Um, the first one is that for the obituaries for the Southern Tidings, the word count is 100 words. Is 100 words. Now, if the deceased worked for the denomination, um, if they were in an official position at the conference office or at the union or division or general conference, um, then the word count is 250 words because we give you the space to detail some of their denominational work and some of their denominational, excuse me, things that they accomplished. Um, that's their so. If it's a member who did not work officially for the denomination, 100 words. If it's a member who worked for the denomination in, at one of the levels of the church, then it's 250 words um, for them. And then you want to make sure that you have a headshot to submit with that particular thing. Um, so you write that up and then you want to submit that to um, the um, union office, and here is the address for the person. That's Miss Irene Dausch, and it's idausch at southernunion.com. Um, and she will make sure that those go into that section. But those are the um, highlights for obituaries to have in the Southern Tidings. A very important section um, because members often look there um, to see who has died so that they can reach out to the family. So articles are submitted to the communication department. Obituaries come directly to the office. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Banks. Oh, I almost forgot what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> oh, for obituaries, can anyone send in a headshot or that's just for those who have worked for the denomination? No, no. So, so the obituaries for any member of your church. I'm talking about with the picture. Oh, that's for anyone. Yes. Yeah. The, the, oh, okay. The, yeah, for, for each, for, um, for each of the obituaries, we kind of ask for a headshot. Okay. Because yeah. someone told, someone told me they would only put in a picture if you were a denominational worker. Yeah. And so it, and it, it mainly, it, it will de you know, so the denominational worker, they, we definitely want a headshot for the denominational worker. We definitely want the headshot for the denominational worker. Um, for the other members, it kind of depends on the overall space that's available. Um, generally, for the, for the member of the church, you won't see a headshot, but for the denominational workers, you will always see one that's submitted. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And you, uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. You said that for art, the only thing we send in to Miss Dausch is the obituaries. Everything else comes to the office, right? That is correct. Yes. So now, if you, who, if you, whose attention do we put it in for the office? Um, let me go because he, they, let me just kind of scroll back through the chat because I'm still in there from the previous sesh, section to find it's two. Um, and I guess the, the host can help us. It's for, Rashad in the union office and I, I have it here. So let me, let me, and I'll put his, that information in the chat here as well. I, I went back and found okay. it here. Okay, there we go. It's to R. Madison, R. Madison at sacsda.org. Oh, they don't go to Mr. Lamb, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, or you can send it to Mr. Lamb, but this is the the uh, associate communication director in the previous workshop had them send it to him. Yeah, 
Um, but you can you can send if you have Mr. Lamb's information, and you can easily send it to him as well. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And we email these in, right? And you email that in, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, so you you email the you email your article as well as photos that you have for that article. Okay. Yeah, and you send those and you send those to the um, conference communication department. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, the other section he asked me to 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 deal to do, and let me find my other screen here. Um, was advertising, and let me get that screen here for you. Um, so as you know, we have the Southern Union website and that website, we have our office personnel, um, Elder R. Stephen Norman, R. S. Norman, who is the communication director and the Southern Tidings editor, myself, the associate director, and then we have Olivia Woodward, Woodward excuse me, who is our designer, and then Irisine, Dowsch, who is the managing editor for, for Southern Tidings. And then Mr. Reggie Madison, who um, is our sign engineer, who, who's there. And then Ms. Uh, Jame Cordova, and she deals with readership engagement, customer service representative. So Jame is the person you call um, if, there is a con if there is a problem, you know, you may not have received um, the Southern Tidings or members have said, man, I haven't gotten Southern Tidings in the last two months. Can you see if my name is still in the list, or if there's something going on? Um, that's who you would contact for, for those things. Um, let me go here quickly here. There we go. Um, so that's Southern Tidings. I mean, Southern Union. The, we have the Southern Tidings has a website as well. Um, and I'm gonna share just some interesting things, some things there for you to know on Southern Tidings. Um, the first place you'll see is you have stories and the stories are, are stories from each of the conferences. So let's say that you wanted to see the stories that were from South Atlantic Conference. You would click stories and there you see the stories that came from um, South Atlantic Conference, and it's for each of the conferences in the Southern Union as well as the institutions. So you will see the Oakwood University that's there, um, and so or Advent Health, Advent Health University, and you will find their articles as well. The second section there is the print version. You can um, go and if someone says, hey, I didn't get mine, you can always point them to Southern Tidings to go to the print version, and they can go and get a version of the magazine. If you notice here, um, the archive goes back to 2006. Um, for every issue that has been printed, they can easily go there and get them. So in this issue, the February issue, um, you will be, they will be able to go through and read the magazine if they did not receive it. And you have to excuse my internet this morning. I have about uh, five windows open and different things going on. So it's, it's taken a second to get there. Um, but there it is. And so you, they will be able to go through and they can read through, um, the Southern tidings online. Um, it's a good resource so that if there is an article that you particularly wrote, and you want um, your friends that may not receive Southern Tidings to see it, you can always take the link from here and send it to them, um, and they will be able to read it from the archives itself. The other section that I want you to see, there's a sunset calendar contact information for us, and it is the section he asked me to deal with again, and that is to talk about advertising for the Southern Union Elder Lamb wants to make sure that you knew how to do that. And in the Southern Union, we offer classified ads that are text um, based on words. 
the number of words is the cost for those as well as display ads. You can do full color. Um, you can do black and white and the cost and things that are there. What he wanted you to particularly know is how to submit your article to the Southern tidings. Um, and this is the critical important part. Um, if you have something that you want, let's say that you have, we'll use the example we used before, you have your 175th church anniversary coming up and you want to let everyone know, um, and you're going to do it through a classified ad. You want to go ahead and type up that classified ad, put that together. And then you want to make sure that the pastor or the church elder, um, signs it and writes on it approved, then you will take the copy that you have printed with their, na ad with their name and signature, and then you wanna make sure your name and address are on there. And you want to get this, the number three is, is critical. How many times you want that ad to run? I only want it to run for the month of April. I want it to run um, for six months, I want to run April, May, June, July, April, May, June, July, August, and September, or I want to run every other month. You want to specify that so that we will make sure that that is done. And then, um, you want to send the approved ad to the conference office. Um, here it has six weeks in advance and for your articles, you want to have, um, them eight weeks out. And, but for the advertising, we give you a little more leeway because we can get those done a lot faster. Uh, it doesn't have to have a whole lot of editing processes and some other things. So those are six weeks in advance. And then you want to include the payment in the envelope uh, made payable to the Southern Union for any ads that you um, want to submit um, and to send in on those. And let, so that's for ads six weeks out, news stories, um, eight weeks out. We, we are, we, we are eight weeks in advance on the Southern tidings. So this is today's February the 6th. If I'm if my mind is working right. Yes. February the 6th. So this week, the March issue for Southern tidings will be at the press. Um, it's going to the press in the next couple of days for the March issue. Um, and so things that are being submitted are being submitted for the April issue. So things that are being submitted in February are actually for the issue in April. If you're writing, um, stories for Southern tidings that you are sending to, that you are sending to your conference communication director, and to that department, those particular things, um, they are asking that they have them in their office by the 20th of the month. So any news stories that you're writing for things that you want to appear in Southern Tidings or things that are happening at your church, um, they're asking that you have them to them by the 20th of every month. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Banks. I saw your hand, so I'm not sure if that's new or if that was from, um, the previous question. Okay. So maybe that's from the previous question. Um, and is, I have a yes. question. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Lynn. Is that Lynn? Is, yes. Is there a time limit for the obituaries? given that publication date kind of thing is, you know, is it too late to send one in? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, for the, for obituaries. the obituaries. Yeah. So we, we, we pretty much follow the same time schedule for the obituaries. Okay. Um, you may have, you know, you may, there may be a little room, um, in that, but you know, so it's so like now, if you were trying to get something, it will be too late to get something from March. Um, mm -hmm. whereas let's say that you are sending in your articles for the March issue, um, would have been, um, January 20th, 
But let's say that there was someone who died in, you know, they died after that time, you know, they died, you know, the end of the month, you could mm -hmm. probably still send that in because um, the full publication, you probably, after the 20th, you probably have um, to the end of the month, the first, the first two or three days of the month to get it in, then it would still be in the issue. So if there was an obituary um, and you had it at the end of January, you could, you could still send that in and, okay. and would probably still make the March issue. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes. Yes. Well, um, so, but we try to, you know, keep it at that 20th to make it a lot easier for the editors who are going through things because they're going through the whole magazine for the layout artists because the layout artist needs to know how much space to allocate for um, obituaries. And so when those things come in, you know, in that time period, they kind of look down and say, okay, I have six obituaries. And so they allocate enough space for those. Um, and then if, you know, February the 2nd, there were 10, 10 came in, you know, the designer would not be as happy because now they have to go back and try to redesign to fit some of those in as they can. But, but there, but those that were pretty flexible to kind of work with you a little more on those. Okay. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. yeah, to kind of help you. I have a question for the, yes, for the articles that we send in, we do not have to have an approved signature on them. Do we, as long as it's coming from the communication secretary. Right. Yes. No, you, you, you don't have to have an approved signature or anything on those. And yeah, you, that article is written and sent directly to um, the South Atlantic Conference Communication Department along with your photos. Yes. And you send that to them with your photos and you want to have you want to have high resolution photos. Um, so the just kind of as a as a a guideline for the photos you want your photo to be at least at least one megabyte in size so you'll see it when you know in they give you the digital copy of it and you'll see the icon and have the name of the photo and it will have one mb or six mb or 12 mb you want to have at least that um if it has um KB for kilobytes, it's going to be very difficult to print that and make it a size that's going to be presentable in the magazine. And we always want to present what is given to us in the best light um, so that it has um, the best quality that's there. So you want to sense on, on your photos that have at least you know, one to two megabytes in size. And that's a good rule of thumb for you to use for anything that you are producing at your local church for any type of publication, your newsletter, or any type of flyers or things that you're doing there um, as well. While, while we're here at that point, let me just, we'll share this with you. Um, I don't know if, if, you're, if you're doing newsletters or anything, but I'll share with you a a good place to start, and I'll put that in the chat as well, for your newsletter is is a is a company called Flocknote. Flocknote. Um, is that free? Um, Flocknote is free if you have less than 40 people. Are you so mean less than 40 people you're emailing them to? That you're sending it to, yes. Yes. Uh. Yes. Now, what about Mailchimp? Um, Mail Mailchimp works great. Mailchimp's not free. Um, I heard that they had a free version. They, I mean, they do, and it's it's and it's 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 going it's going to be limited in the number of people you can send it to. Okay. Yes, it's it's going to be limited in that number that you can send it to. Um, so that um which, and. Which which yes. of all those that you know of, which one do you like the best for newsletters? The one, the one that that I like the best that I've been using, you know, for the last six years is Flocknote. How much is that? Um, let's we'll we'll take a look here and see. Um, 
flock note. I'm, I'm trying to think because when I was pastor of media and worship here in California, we were using flock note and we had, oh, about 20, we probably had about 2,300 in that list. And it was less than $90 a month. Um, but I, since I'm here, I'll. Okay, what if, what if you only have maybe 75? Right, so I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm give me a second here. I'm going to okay. their website now and I will pull it up here for you so that you all can see that. Let me switch this screen over so that you can see. Um, let's see, did it bring it up? So. Okay. Move myself here. Okay, so here is here is the website for Flockno while they're struggling here for a minute. Okay. Um so as I said, under forty members, you know, it's free. Here we go. So so you said you said seventy five members? Well just say less than a hundred. Okay, so we'll so we'll do ninety nine members, um, twenty two dollars a month. Oh, that's all. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's, that's what I'm saying. It's it's very, it's it's very it's very reasonable, very affordable. Um, and and I, I and I'll, I'll share with you, what, I'll share with you the way to do that, and that is to start with the free plan and have your member there are two ways you can do it you can have your members opt in to join and your list grows as the members grow so when i first got ready to do it i, I was talking with flock note and we were talking so some things and they said you know well, how and I, I said i'm looking at how many members i have and so it was going to be um 131 dollars a month because we had about 2,300 members. And he said to me, he said, so do not put all of your members in. He said, don't put anyone in, let them join. He said, and as your list grows, um, your amount grows. He says, because I, what I don't want you to do is to put in your 2,300 members, put all your members in, you're at $131 a month, and you have 90 members who are, who are utilizing the service. Um, and so I would say to you is start, do the free trial, start there, have the members join in, and as the list grows, they increase. So the, I'll go back to that. So you see, when you get to 41 members, then it will hit $8. How much? Eight, $8 a month. Oh, okay. From 41 members to to um, 50, um, and then it goes from 51 to 70 at $15, 71 to 100 at $22, 101 to $236. So it, it, it works when you allow your list to organically grow, um, and that helps you in terms of your, 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 your spending for it. One of the great things that I like, especially about um, Flocknote is Flocknote allows you to do a couple of things. It was created as a texting service um, so that you can send um, text to your congregation. Um, and so when you go to, um, I'm trying to see if, I don't know if, let's see if I can, still can, I'll show you. Um, so when you go to your page it you know it asked you a couple of things uh that's not the one i want to use here let's see if i can get let's see if i can oops i okay i must have taken i must have taken the other one out i was trying to actually get to one of the one of the pages there um so when you go in 
and you begin to create your note, it will ask you, um, do you, you create, do, or are you making a text message or are you making an email message? And you decide which of those you're doing mm -hmm. and you create that message. When you finished creating that message and you can schedule it for a later time and date to go out, when you get ready to hit send or send, it will tell you, um, you have, you know, say you have 99, 99 people you're sending it to. It will tell you um, 25 of these people um, do not have an email address. Um, and it will send it to them as a text message. Or it will say three people don't have a cell phone number listed or an email address, but they have their landline. It will call them and read them the message. Um, and so um, I really like this one because with that one click, you're able to hit everyone um, because some people only put in their email address some only put their home phone their landline some only put their text but you're able to still communicate with them at that one place rather than do three separate um mailings or texting or phone calls to them um so okay. I, yes okay. yes ma'am if if i am setting up the information for the newsletter mm -hmm. and i I send them all of the email addresses I wanted to go to, right? You could, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I can also use this spot you know, to send messages. That's what you're saying. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. And they already for the messages, they would already have the email addresses I've sent in. Right. So yes. And so you would you would you would you can you can log in and you can put in any email address that you need to put in anything that you want to want to go in there um and it will go there and so when you then go to create your things let's see here if this is let's see if this is and so when you go to create your things um you can create list um so let, let me i'll show you this one uh let's see if i can get back to that page here okay so there we go so if you'll see here on on the left hand side here uh, it has kids ministries kids ministry update these are all groups so you can have you know a group i had a group that said everyone you can have a group that says um children's sabbath schools you can have sabbath schools and you can have children's Sabbath schools, kindergarten, primary, youth, young adult, adult, um, any organizations that you have, pathfinders, adventurers, you know, busy bees. Each organization can create their own group and they can send it to their specific group if they want to. Okay. Um, and so that, you know, that that has worked that has worked very well um in in churches around the country. Um one of the easiest ways to um, get the names is you can allow people to join through text. So you give them, you say, you know, here, here's the code, um, you know, so you want to, you know, you want to, you know, they'll give you the number, you know, so the number is, you know, five, five, three, two, one, and you text and you text the message Savannah church. You text the message Savannah Church. It opens up a screen that says, you know, welcome to Savannah Church and thank you for joining Flocknote. And it asks for information, name, phone number, um, email address, cell phone number, and people decide what they want to give. And once they hit submit, they are automatically added to your list. So you won't have to go and um, do all of that work. And plus it asks, it gives them a list what groups are you a part of that you would like to join and they go through and they check off you know adult sabbath school um ay pathfinders um they check off deacons you know they and so they just kind of um, communication av and they're automatically added to all of those lists as well and so i really like flock note for for that for its ease of use 
um, for churches to have. Okay, um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, I really like that feature where if they don't have email, it'll flip to a text message or it'll flip to a landline. I'm yes. assuming all of that information already has to be in the flock note system, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, okay. I, because my church is old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> they have a lot of seniors. And some of them basically are still on landline. And it's yes. been really difficult to tie them into the church <clears throat> yes. um, during this pandemic mess. So yes. this is a great, great, great idea and service. I appreciate your sharing it. Oh, yes. And so that that one is great because it will call them. So if you created, you know, if you created a a text message to go out to everyone and, you know, and it said, um, that, you know, the text message may have said, you know, that because of the bad weather, we're not meeting in person today. Mm -hmm. We're not, we won't be meeting on this side, but, you know, go to the, 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 church's web page to view the service that's your text message that goes out but you have that member who doesn't have a cell phone it will call them perfect that's perfect. and it will read them that message perfect yeah so so that that feature is that feature is very useful okay okay um suppose you have okay will this feature even for those who have emails mm -hmm. Can it be used as a robocall to go to everyone's phone? Um, even those who have emails or that's just for those who don't? Um, the. In other words, if right, I had. Right. So, right. So the, 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 the system, the system is going to use the primary method that you that you selected so if you selected email that it's going to start with emails okay. and work its way down if you selected text it's going to start with text and work its way up or down but there is no function to start with a call okay yeah so so yeah so it it, it will be it's it's really no way to to force it to do it to make it a robo caller okay yeah Yeah, so it's really, it's really no way to force it to do that. Um, let let me share. I'm gonna share two because you, you you said one of the words. So I'm going I'm gonna share two things that that use one of your favorite words, Miss Banks, and that was free. <laughs> um, I don't know if you all are familiar with Grammarly. Yes. Yes. Um, so Grammarly offers its premium service to nonprofits for free. Now, what what's the name of this company? Grammarly. G R A M M A R L Y. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so you can go there and look for Grammarly for nonprofits, and they have a um, little informational thing that you fill out um, so that they can verify you are a nonprofit, and then they give you the, and then they give you their premium package for free. And you can uh, create your team in Grammarly. So you can set up, you know, if there are four or five or six people that write with you there at church, um, and they can each have their account to create their things. Um, everything I write after I'm finished, I run it through Grammarly um, just to, yes. to give. <laughs> Which Lynn said yes. yes. <laughs> Lynn said, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Grammarly. Grammarly is for newsletters. Um, it's for I, any writing. For any for any writing. Yes. Yeah, so I any the, yeah any article yeah. that I write, I put in Grammarly. Any letter that I'm doing, they, they I, send I run that through. to the emails too. Say that again. Grammarly sends. Oh no, ma'am, no, no. Oh, okay. No, Gra Gra Grammarly is Grammarly's like it's like a a a copy editor. It, it's going to oh, proof okay. it. It's going to proof it, look for misspellings, grammar, and it's going to offer you suggestions on ways that you could have written it better. Okay. Um, so where, where do where do I send my article? Grammarly at what? I mean. Yes. So so I, let me let me see if I can. I'll pull up my Grammarly site. Even here. even if you don't do the premium, the free service is is good as well. Because yes, I used it, that for a is. long time before I 
before I flipped. Um, but yeah, everything I write, try to take it through Grammarly. Oh how, yes, how, yes. How do I send it to Grammarly? Oh, so um, no, here I will. I'll give. Let me. I'll switch over my screen and I'll show you. You here. sign up for it. Yeah. And then it automatically, whenever you're typing, pops in. It pops yes. in my emails. It pops yes, in it my sure articles. Does. It pops in my bulletin. Yes, it pops yes. in everywhere. Yeah, it shows up everywhere. So I've, I've signed into mine <clears throat> here. Oh, I um, How do I? Oh, so you, you go to Grammarly.com to sign up. So when I go to Grammarly.com and sign up, if I'm typing a Word article, it it comes on or I have to send it to them. Mm -mm. It no, pops up. It will show it will show up. It, oh. will, it will, yeah, it's the icon shows up and you can click it and it will it will go through. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. it, 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 it's it's integrated into most of the word processors. So all I have to do is sign up with Grammarly. Yes. Yes, yes. So yeah, Gra Grammarly is so uh, um, let's see how see if i, I wish can I, find. I wish i had it in college <laughs> yes oh who oh, who oh oh my goodness don't we <laughs> don't don't we all wish that we had had that in <laughs> that we had had that in in college um i'll just i'll grab this just as an example um something that i i had started working on for this workshop that i just kind of threw some stuff in so it asks you to set your goals um, is your audience general knowledge or the expert? Is it informal, neutral, or formal article? Um, is it for academic, business, casual, email? What's the tone that you want? What's the intent that you're doing? Um, so you kind of go through those. So I just I'll leave it at the defaults that it has. So it get, so it has a default. Then it comes up and it shows begins to show suggestions. So it gives me an overall score and correctness. So it has 19 things that it's suggesting that I do. Um, gives you clarity. It says the engagement is a bit bland. Um, the delivery is slightly off. The style is all good. So it gives you those things and then it kind of goes through and gives you, so it's saying here um, that an article is missing. Um, so you can you can click on it. And so it's saying that the article is missing in there because it just says your headline is the first and perhaps only impression you can make. And so you can, it's saying that it should be the impression that you make. And then it just keeps going through making those suggestions um, along the way for things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gives you um, a score as you make those suggestions if you take them it continues to um suggest your score for the overall writing um now this this one it says the engagement was a bit bland because these were just my working notes that i had kind of pulled together as i was putting the presentation together so it wasn't something that i was writing to send to anyone it was just notes that i was kind of putting together for myself but grammarly is great um and then when you go through when I, I use the one online, but when you go through, um, you can download that particular article and it's ready to go. Um, as Lynn's using it, she's using it inside of, you're using inside of Word or inside of um, another word processing service. It's yeah, there. Word. It's making those changes as you go so that when you save that, the, the, the corrected copy is saved. So mm -hmm. I, I really like Grammarly for, yeah. for that. And it pops up in my emails. It, it comes in my emails, especially for my emails. It, it's the crucial thing is the tone of my emails when they're going to church members or going wherever. And they'll ask me, is this the tone you want? It'll is have little funny faces. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's really a helpful tool. Yes, it is. Yeah, it, it really oh, is. Man. Yeah. Is that it asks, is that the tone? Is that the tone that you want? Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> which which really is very helpful for if you're sending stuff um, to people. But so those are two. So that one. Um, the Grammarly I shared with you, the, oh, oh yes. The other one is, is Canva. I don't know if either of you are using Canva. What does um, that do? I've Canva, it, I've heard of it. Yeah. Canva, Canva is, um, a software that allows you to do 
graphic design. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that K C A N V V A? Yes, C A N V A. Yes. Excuse me. When we had the presentation uh, earlier, the the presenter introduced Canva to uh, those who were in, in the uh, session. Oh, great. Okay. And yes. it was she gave a really great illustration on how to use it. Oh, good, good, good. Yes. That that's Canva.com. That's Canva.com. Yes, ma'am. And so Canva offers um, nonprofit organizations um, free to their premium as well. Um, and you can set up, you know, your teams. But Canva is another one. If you need to create a poster or a flyer, those kind of things, Canva is is great to use as well. Yeah, so I just wanted okay. to kind of share those with with you all. So Canva is like graphic art, you say? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, Canva, Canva is 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 graphic arts and design. So the inverted pyramid that I had in the presentation is one that I created in Canva. Oh, okay. Yes, that that was one that I that I actually did inside of this one. Yeah, so that's, I, I actually did that inside of Canva. Okay, now with the flood notes, when I do my newsletter, do they have templates that you choose from? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, so they're, 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 they, they have um, multiple templates that you can use, you know, or you can create your own. Um, but yeah, they have, they have a lot of templates that are there to use. Yeah, which which makes which makes it very, very easy to use. Okay. Well, I I I I again I say by name. Or I'll put. Let me put my contact here in the chat for you as well. So I am just. I am B Taylor, at southernunion.com. And again, my name is Brian Taylor. I'm the Associate Communication Director for Communications at Southern Union. I thank you all for spending your time with me um, this afternoon. I hope that it was meaningful and that you gain information that is helpful to you as you are the communication specialist for your church. Um, if I can be of any assistance to you along the way, please feel free to reach out to me and contact me and I will do all that I can to help you. And I thank you very much.